Well, we are going to crack on with um, our next uh, speaker. Uh, you've already had him uh, advertised here. He, he, when I said, I would ask him to give me uh, a fact about him that perhaps uh, people wouldn't know, or perhaps I wouldn't know. Uh, he told me he was James Randi's apprentice. I'm like, oh, can I touch you? Uh, uh, and if I touch you, will my hand bend like this? <laughs> when I do this. So uh, we'll please welcome him to the stage uh, for your next session to talk about uh, being skeptic on YouTube and how you can get involved in that. Please welcome to the stage uh, Massimo Policy. Hello, good morning. Nice to see you. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about a subject that um, to many may appear quite mysterious. The YouTube, well, not too many, but I mean, two generations that are maybe nearer to me, not younger generations. It is a tool, it is a subject that uh, it is not often discussed, unfortunately, and uh, we'll soon see why it is important to do it. Since uh, skepticism was uh, born as, a, as an organized movement in 1976 with the creation of the Committee for the Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, and we see here uh, some of the founders, Randy, of course, Paul Kurtz, uh, uh, Paul, uh, Paul uh, oh, let me see, Barry Carr, you can even recognize him. A constant goal has been the need to reach as wider an audience as possible. The skeptic's message was quite upstream at the time. Actually, it still is. What we are saying is that uh, people should be skeptical of unsubstantiated, uh, this is Italian, unsubstantiated claims, especially if they are extraordinary ones. At the time, UFOs, astrology, the paranormal, spiritualism, all of these and many other topics uh, were usually regarded to be quite valid among the general public. And unfortunately, they still are. But have actually no substance at all. So back then, how did you go about uh, spreading this kind of information to the public? Well, at first, there were the skeptical magazines. Skeptical Inquirer is the mother of all skeptical magazines. And it was a great thing to do, of course. But even though a magazine was essential, and in some cases it still is, to get uh, updates or even to go deeper into special subjects, it had a very limited reach. And most importantly, you were not uh, talking to the general public, but to those that were already convinced. So how did you reach, try to reach a wider audience? You could lecture, you could give lectures on uh, various occasions, but how many dozens or hundreds of people could you reach with a talk? Well, if you had, if you had done enough research and work, you could even write a book, which is a fantastic uh, thing to do. You have to find a publisher, which is was and is not easy to do, but a book allows you to go a lot deeper into the subject and really eviscerate the subject and give the whole uh, panorama of, of your argument. But still, how many of those who watched uh, talk shows on TV, the kind of talk shows where the paranormal was a, a constant subject and uh, it usually had a very non-critical treatment how many of those actually read any skeptical literature? How many of those actually read any books at all? According to surveys, this is related to today, things not really look bright. Just looking at Europe, those that read books in this service by Eurostat are at most 20% of the population. And how much time is spent reading a book every day? It's between 2 and 13 minutes, says the same survey. United Kingdom, 6 minutes. You won't even look at uh, Italy, 5 minutes, even less. However, just look at the time spent watching television. 
According to the International Communications Market Report, the average American watches 282 minutes of broadcast television per day, four hours and 42 minutes. Italy is the third. You're lucky. You're above 200 minutes, but still. Things were not all that different in the 1970s and following decades. People were glued to television and were not reading skeptical literature. So, well, the obvious reaction was to try and get on television. But that was not easy at all. Of course, there were exceptions. James Randi, which we mentioned at the beginning, was great at getting on TV and putting on a fantastic show and uh, the thing to see and you could listen to him for hours. It was great, but it was the exception, as we said. The regular skeptic actually had to wait for some TV program to call him or her as an expert, maybe on a panel, and maybe the other panelists were a vampirologist, a medium, an astrologer, an aura reader, they all had their saying, claiming wonderful things and uh, amazing powers and whatever. And in the last five minutes of the show, the host will ask the skeptic, so what's your opinion on this? And the skeptic was you know, waiting to counterattack that idiocy that he was listening to for an hour, uh, only managed to appear to be a closed-minded denier probably paid by the CIA or Soros. <laughs> and in, in any case, it was constantly interrupted by the other guests who were shocked and protested against these attacks. And in a blink, his time was up so much for the skeptical point of view. But now, things have changed. In less than one generation, we have reached a point where what we watch, read, listen to is no longer determined only by corporate monopolies, but by the viewer. And things can be a lot different for skeptics as well. And it is up to us to catch this challenge while there is still time. Today, especially young people read less and less. But, and this is important, they also spend less time on TV. Young people should be the main target audience, I think, for skeptics. For adults already have their mindset, and uh, very rarely an adult changes his mind. Children and young adults are still building their reasoning faculties, and if they are given the tools with which they can operate in the world and nurture a critical mind, they will become skeptical by themselves and, uh, when they grow up, and they will have no need for others to tell them. In Italy, we, after many years of trying, CICAP, which is the Italian Committee for the Investigation of Claims of Pseudoscience, which I'm the executive director, after many years of work, has been able to finally sign an agreement with the Ministry of Education, by which we can offer uh, recognized courses to teachers and students alike in schools all over Italy, sharing a scientific approach and critical thinking skills. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very nice thing to have reached, of course. It not, was not easy, and it's not going to be easy you know, to put it in practice uh, because we are still so many volunteers. And, but, but this is a great step. I understand, I understand, of course, this is not something that you can do on your free time and something that not every skeptic organization can do easily. But there are simpler ways by which we could reach a wider and younger your audience. So what do you find young people today? Online, of course. Yes, but where exactly? On Facebook? No, Facebook is for grandpa. <laughs> they usually are on Instagram or YouTube. Actually, today, 1.5 billion people turn to YouTube every month to search about something that they are interested in and can't find anywhere else. <coughs> Many look for funny videos, uh, the latest viral, even the news and TV shows are there. But many just come to learn something 
or indulge an interest. And it is these people that we should be talking right now. Is this something crazy, making videos and put them on YouTube? Absolutely not. There are hundreds of thousands of creators around the world who are turning their creativity into careers, amassing huge followings, and turn a hobby into a profession. There are makeup artists, video gamers, travelers who talk about their trips, cooks who share recipes, uh, vloggers. Why shouldn't the skeptics join in? In fact, some have, and you can find them on YouTube. A uh, few have reached fantastic results. And just to name a couple of friends of QED, uh, Captain Disillusion has over a million subscribers. Or, well, this is dispute. Maybe no, this is all uh, part of the conspiracy. Someone called Richard <laughs> Wiseman has more than two million. But usually, apart from the great exceptions, skeptical videos uh, rarely touch the topics that young people uh, are more interested in. You know, we usually, you can find many uh, long discussion of, discussions about the philosophy of skepticism or very specific technical issues. And the, the topics that they're interested the most in, the ones that we have discussed and discussed and we are uh, bored to death probably with many of them, are not analyzed or discussed on YouTube videos. But this is an audience that doesn't have our background, doesn't, have our, doesn't share our interest, and everything is new. So if you go online and you search for ghosts, search for the paranormal, search for uh, UFOs, you find tons of videos that are all a critical, with no critical point of view at all. They all present the same things, actually, the same claims, the same uh, examples, the same episodes that we all know about, we have read about and discussed, and we know they are already explained, but the general public doesn't. And, uh, and, they only, and if they only find this kind of videos, what conclusion can they reach? So it is with this situation in mind that I decided last April to try and start doing something on, on this line, uh, a YouTube series in Italian. It's called Strane Storie, which means strange stories. It runs weekly, every Friday at 1.30 p.m. It's important to have regularity when you do something like this, because you start to create a community, you start to create a, a report with the people that come and view the videos and comment below the video. And it's important that you, you reply to the comments and you reply to the questions because a trust is built. And, and I can see it. Um, these are 10 to 15 minute episodes. This is the last one that came up uh, yesterday. When I examine popular and unusual claims uh, and uh, by the end of each show, I arrive at the conclusion about their credibility. I dealt, of course, with the classics, Bermuda Triangle, Loch Ness Monster, the Pyramids, the Shroud of Turing, ghosts, aliens, and so on. And also some less popular ones, like cursed paintings, Cottingley fairies. This is the Chronovisor. Have you ever heard of this one? Chronovisor was a, a machine hidden in the Vatican, where else, built by a priest, and through which he could see into the past, like a television, but he could see live Napoleon talking or, you know, the, whatever you choose. He chose to go back to the Roman Empire and watch Cicero play and, and talk and, and discuss, and he, he took notes. But when you asked him, fantastic, can we see the machine? Ah, well, you know, it's very difficult. I can show you a picture that I taken from the screen. And in the end, he was pressured 
to, to show some kind of proof of what he claimed. And he said, okay, I've gone back 2,000 years and I've seen the crucifixion. And when I was there, I took a picture of, of the passion of Christ. So this is the picture. And the picture was published in a, in a magazine. And it really had, you know, the face, a very close-up portrait of the uh, face of Christ in, in, in pain. And it was interesting because after a week that the photo was published, somebody wrote to the, to the magazine and said, oh, that's, that's very interesting because it's identical to a postcard that I bought at a, at a basilica where there is a, a Christ made of wood um, with the same face, but not only the same face, the same shadows and same lights. They look identical. And in fact, it was a picture of the postcard. But since then, you know, the, the priest disappeared and said, this machine must be destroyed because it could go into the wrong hands. <laughs> so there's no trace of the throne of Israel. Anyway, this is a, an example of the stories that you, that you can find. As I said, I started, I didn't have a, a, an active YouTube channel before. I used it, you know, to put some videos taken from a lecture, from a TV show, but I didn't produce anything. In about a week after starting, after I started putting the first video, I reached uh, a thousand subscribers. Then soon they were 2,000, then 3,000, and then after now it's six months and they are around 8,000 and keep on growing. Every day I see it grow and the people commenting below grows and, and there's always people returning every video and you start making almost friendships with, with them. The great thing about YouTube uh, is that it is not a social outlet like Facebook or Twitter, where everything that you publish gets quickly lost in the stream and it's gone. YouTube is a search engine. Actually, it's the second largest search engine in the world after Google. And guess what? Google owns YouTube. This means that whenever someone looks uh, for a specific topic, and your video is about that topic, it may come up on both search engines. And this can happen after a month you published your video, a year, 10 years. A magazine only lasts a week. A book in a bookstore, maybe if it reaches the bookstore, of course, two or three months, if it's lucky, and then it's gone, unless you know what to look for. A TV show lasts only a few minutes and then it's gone or you can maybe search for it, but you have to know it's there. The videos on YouTube instead stay there, ready to be found by anybody searching for that very specific subject. And if somebody is interested in this kind of, of topics and they find your video and they find it interesting, entertaining, uh, they see that you have other videos on other similar subjects. They may be interested in looking at them as well. Subscribe to your channel and keep updated. And, and you start building uh, your library of videos while the people watching you start building their own uh, mind frame. There are, oops, this is too, le too early, okay. There are, what was I saying? There are, no, okay, this is. There are two, three to five, three to five billion consumers coming online between now and 2020. So that's why right now is a great time to get started on YouTube. And this is also the reason for which I have decided to start producing a new series along Strane Storie. And this time, it's in English, and I hope I can have it started. Let's see if it works. Time travelers, cursed paintings, ghostly apparitions, mysterious creatures. The world is filled with incredible and seemingly inexplicable stories, but often things are not what they seem. Yeah. 
if you are like me and you too want to learn how to discern fact from fiction, I invite you to join me every two weeks on my YouTube channel. I am Massimo Polidoro and we'll investigate together and discover the truth behind many stranger stories. Starts October 31st, of course. <laughs> what other date would we choose? Why? <laughs> you know. So, uh, this is, of course, this, this takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of work, you know, and it's not something that you can, you can do in your spare time. Uh, you have to, to set aside time every week to work on a, on a series. But it is important to do it, and I think it's a good investment for skeptics because it's, 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 a, it's an outlet that you, you control in a way that, that you can put your videos whenever you want about the subjects you want, and you are not controlled by a TV station calling you or a book publisher uh, asking you to do something. You are deciding what you're doing, and uh, you can build a very, a very large community. And I'm sure this is... A, an opportunity for many of us. And I would like, you know, to, to share the experience I've uh, so far, which is very little, but still the results are, are interesting. And uh, as, as I say, I'm not a technical guy, but uh, if I can do it, you know, anybody can do it. I would like to also to give you uh, a few highlights of the first episode to give you a taste of what, of what this is. And this, uh, and this is it. In 1974, a man was unexpectedly challenged on live television to guess the content of a sealed envelope and then bend a solid stainless steel spoon. Incredibly, he was able to do both. His name? No, not Yuri Geller, but James Randi. Today, at Stranger Stories, we will see Randi perform that incredible feat, and then we'll learn how he did it. Ready? Let's go. In November 1974, Randy was invited to be a guest of a Canadian TV show titled ESP Special People on the Global Television Network. Suddenly, Spraggett took two oversized, heavy, sturdy spoons from his desk and challenged Randy to bend them. They were not at all similar to the spoons that Geller had bent for Spraggett. Without ever letting them go, Spraggett held the handles of the spoon and Randy lightly stroked the bowls. Then the journalist discarded one spoon and they concentrated on the other. Spraggett agreed that at no time did Randy put undue pressure on them. After a moment, the spoon suddenly seemed to become like plastic, sheared off and broke into two pieces. Spraggett lost some color in his face. The spoon, Spraggett said, trying to... When I first met Randy now 30 years ago, one of the first things that I asked him was how on earth had he been able to pull off that stunt on Spraggett's show? I read, and the solution is quite surprising. Some time ago, on a performance together, I asked Randy to explain how he did it. Well, I will say this too. Sometimes, whoever it is up there or down there, I'm not sure which, if at all, Sometimes they smile on magicians. <laughs> how do you say, oh, hallelujah? <laughs> we were very happy to see that because we knew that the second guy had never met us. It is okay. If Spraggett never checked all of the possible trails in order to find a solution to the mystery that had baffled him, one can be pretty sure that he never bothered to look for alternatives to the paranormal explanation when he met Uri Geller and other psychics to accommodate you. Until next time. Okay, uh, well, it lasts, uh, of course, 15 minutes, so this is just an highlight. Uh, but you can see that the possibilities are really uh, infinite. You can choose your own subject, you can choose whatever you are passionate about. Uh, I decided to start the first episode with this episode, uh, of Randy's life because it's a very uh, entertaining, ingenious, 
way to show how a skeptic can work. Uh, and, and it shows you how smart and, uh, and, how, and how fun you can have with a, with a skeptical uh, frame of mind. Uh, Rand, of course, is, uh, is coming in a, in a week. Uh, uh, is anybody here coming to Las Vegas next week? No? Even George? No. Okay. Well, if you did, uh, if you do, if, 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 well, in case, in case somebody decides at the last minute to, to join us, uh, Randy is going to be there and uh, it's going to be fun to, to be with him this occasion. Randy would have loved, you know, if uh, YouTube was available yeah, in his times because he had so many things to tell, so many interesting stories to share. Uh, but YouTube was not there, and when, when he started uh, putting something on YouTube, it was the early stages, and it was, uh, it was aimed to a different kind of audience, maybe, with the foundation. So what he did was not uh, what you would do today. But he, he would be, you know, a great uh, YouTube host for a, for a series. But there is, as I said, there is a lot of room for skeptics. There is a lot of, of uh, demand as well. There are people and there are kids asking for information about these topics. Information that is not completely gullible, but can make them reason and use their, their powers of, uh, of reasoning. And if you provide it, you're going to make a huge difference uh, in their lives. So I hope that here, maybe this has sparkled an interest in some of you, and, uh, and I hope that you can uh, decide to do it. As I said, I'm not uh, technically inclined, and I had to learn uh, everything that you need to do. I've been a lot on television, of course, but always in front of the camera. I never produced, so I had to learn how to shoot, how to uh, use what kind of, of equipment you need to use, how to position the lights, how to use the green screen, how to edit. And I understand it may seem daunting, but you can start with just camera you have in your phone. That's enough to start. And, and as I said before, if I was able to do it, anyone, anyone really can do it. So I, as I said, I hope that I have uh, inspired some of, some of you to start a YouTube channel, and I look forward to, to look it, to, to watch it, to watch your own series. Uh, it may take a while to start, but uh, I would like to take maybe these few minutes left for any questions you may have, even technical, even uh, whatever you think uh, you would like to know uh, about starting a YouTube series. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm well. not going to do questions. Absolutely. Oh, no, no, don't right. go anywhere. No, no, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Uh, the way we run, run questions here at QED is if you have a question, please come to the microphone and form an orderly queue, and we will take questions from the microphone there. Uh, if for some reason you can't make it to the microphone, uh, one of our volunteers will bring you a microphone. But if there are any questions at all, please shuffle yourself towards the microphone. Um, I mean, I've got questions from me as mm -hmm. well. You say you, you've learned all of these new things from scratch. When did you first get the... How, how long did it take to feel confident about those technical things? I think that I started uh, thinking that it, it was something that I needed to do early this year, actually. Okay. Wow, that's a really short time. Frame. It's a short time. Yeah, I can see it. Uh, but I, I started studying other channels. Yeah. And also, the great thing about YouTube is that you can find... That, um, you can find out how to do how all these to things. Do it. You're yes, on YouTube exactly. already. On YouTube already. <laughs> yes, there is a on YouTube channel the creator side of it. And they teach you how yeah. to do many things, but there are also other creators that uh, are really passionate about their work and tell you about the cameras to use, how to make the lights, and, and whatever. So it's it's very all there useful. already. Yes. Honestly, my father-in-law fixed our toilet seat yesterday with a YouTube video. So if he can do that, then you can run your own YouTube channel from that. Um, please, first question there. Um, if anyone does have a question, you can't make it to the mic. You can Yell raise now. the mic. It's a bit low. <laughs> <laughs> I can help you with that. 
There you are. Cheers. Thank you. I just really enjoyed the talk. I'm fascinating. I just really wanted to know um, how much uh, time uh, and I guess money as well would it take to set up a channel? Um, you know, from learning how to do green screen and whatnot, all the way up to say when the video is uploaded. Well, as I said, you can start with, with just a camera on your phone. You, know, you set it and try to have a, a good natural light, and that would be enough. Um, how much time? It depends because I need. I like to do things. Uh, um, I, I like to write what I'm saying, so I have a, a written text that I can change when I when I when I when I say it. But uh, I want to know where I'm going, and it saves time. And also something that saves time is. Um, Recording in batches, you know, you record three, four episodes in one day, and then you only have to edit them. Uh, but it takes, uh, let's say, one day to make all these shootings, and then uh, for every editing, for every episode, which is 10 to 15 minutes, you need at least another day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can I add a follow-on question? The, the script, you mentioned scripting there, which I think comes easily to you from your experience already. But how yes. long does that scripting take? Because I feel like with a lot of YouTube content, you can get away with um, l less good video quality as long as the content is really good. So is, how long does that take you? Well, it takes me not, not long, as you said, yeah. because I'm, I'm accustomed to writing and I've written hundreds of yeah. articles and I can you know, draw from those. Yeah. And uh, in November is coming out my 50th book, 50th. So uh, I have a lot of material that I can rely on. <laughs> But the scripting is, is but really the scripting, key, yes. isn't it? Yeah. But also, you, you, know, you can improvise. If, if a subject is, is your, uh, at your fingertips and you're very familiar with it, you can improvise. You have, at least you sign down the, the points you want to discuss, and then you can edit. Of course, all of the moments that you are uh, and uh, whatever, uh, you just cut them out. Yeah. So it, it looks like it's, it's very fast. Hi, Ms. Mo. The show looks great. Uh, are you doing it purely as skeptical outreach or are you hoping it will turn a profit uh, as a show? Okay, this is a good question because some people really have started a career. I've seen, I have friends that have like uh, 100,000 followers and what they're making is from YouTube because YouTube pays you for the little ads that appear uh, on the bottom or at the beginning of every video. It pays like um, 300, 400, euros, pounds, let's say, which is not enough to make a career. But the interesting thing is that when you, when you start building a following of that kind, you get other offers of, of other kinds, uh, partnerships, maybe. Uh, maybe you're asked to write a book on the subject. Maybe come talking for us on, on your subject, and, and they pay for you, and they pay you for that. Uh, so, there is a, an economical part of it which comes eventually. You, know, you, you should not start with thinking this is going to make money because it's, yeah. it's not going to be, it's not going to happen at least, for, at least for a few years at least. But if you keep at it, you see the difference. Uh, you start building a, a strong community and that can, can, can allow you to make a lot of things apart from the videos. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. I think that, that thing about community is important. There's the community here exactly. of QuetCon and the community on YouTube. People yeah. you've never physically met. <laughs> and Absolutely. You're suddenly and then, and then another, another step is to organize meetings with the people that follow you on, on YouTube and, and they can get together and meet for the first time and get stronger. Yeah. I have a multi-part question. What is your demographic? Is it the demographic that you were aiming at? And uh, do you, are you happy with it or do you want to broaden it? The last one? Yeah. Or do you want to broaden the demographic that you have? Thank you, Claire. Yes, absolutely, I want to broaden the demographic. Uh, at the moment, I think it's, uh, but it, this is general for you to uh, mainly uh, a male audience, like 70 to 80 percent, while a female audience is more on Instagram, for example, the majority is there. So I try to to be on, on both places, on the other social media. Of course, when you publish a video, you have to let people know that the, the video is published. People following you will know, but the others won't. So you need to publicize it in your other social outlets. So that's why you need to, to have them. Sorry, I meant age. Sorry, I didn't make myself age. clear. Age, I think we are between uh, 
uh, the 20 and um, 50. Okay. I'd like to, to lower it. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry, I tried to get it the height of the average skeptic and I've got it horribly wrong. There is no such thing as an average skeptic. It I'm lower no the average. Um, I suppose this is a technical question. Going f uh, ahead of a camera phone and natural light, what was your investment in equipment and setting all this up? Okay, that's a good question. Um, as I said, I, I tried doing it with the phone, but that was not the quality I was looking for. So I, I found a very nice camera that makes film as well. And, we, uh, and I think it's about 700, 800. And then the lights actually are very cheap. With less than 100, you can have, I have five lights, five points of lights. Uh, because you need, when you do the green screen like I do, and what, what you need the green screen to put you know, backgrounds or whatever, you can do it in your room. You don't need a, a green screen, but I like to do it that way. Uh, you need two lights to, to put the light solely on the green screen because it needs to be very well lit. And then I have uh, another light on me behind the camera, on this side, and another one from behind because it detaches you from the background, the light from behind. And then uh, another one eventually you need it. Uh, as, as I said, this is not, not very expensive. One important thing where you should invest is the microphone. Because when you watch videos on YouTube, often you, maybe they look great, but they, 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 they're terrible. The audio is terrible. And you just need a, a very good mic, either one here on lapel like, like I use, or uh, a direct microphone from the camera. There are many, many possibilities. There's, there's a, it's an investment you do in the beginning, yes. Um, but as I said, it, it, it will pay out in many ways. Thank you. What? First of all, thank you very much for doing this, because um, I've been a follower of your, your <laughs> series, and uh, I quite like it. Um, but um, it struck me that um, you do this um, on your own. So it's a one... It's a one-man production team, <laughs> if uh, so to speak. Um, but it's, I, I don't think you, you, you are an exception um, in this regard. So m many YouTubers are doing this on their own. But on the other hand, you, you do have a massive and very successful um, organization behind you. So what's the reason for not bringing the, uh, a cheek up in and, and doing it on your own? Good question. Yes, in, on YouTube you will find that many uh, YouTubers, as they call them, uh, work on their own, at least in the beginning, and maybe, maybe for years, but in the beginning they work on their own because uh, it's expensive to, to bring in other people unless they're friends, unless they're family. Uh, so I decided to start like this, but soon I, I can see that I need, I'm going to need help, and I'm considering it now. Mm, Chick Up uh, has uh, started a, a podcast recently, which is working very well. Um, has uh, lots of other activities, uh, but I wanted this to be separate from Chick Up to to have a, a, another voice, because we can have a lot of voice with Chick Up, but we need to multiply the voices, not just keep one one voice alone, because from the outside. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the skeptics, it's chick up, whatever. But if you, I see from, from my channel that I reach a lot of people that don't even know what chick up is. So this is uh, the aim. Uh, they, they approach the subject because they're interested. They find uh, that, that this could be very interesting. And then they find chick up. So it's mm -hmm. like bring it in from, from other places. All right. Mm -hmm. There is something about YouTube that it's because you say it's full of independent creators. Mm -hmm. People kind of sometimes are wary of the whiff of a sponsored video or a big organization. Yeah. And they, they really are looking for independent mm -hmm. curated yeah. stuff. And so that's, that's what this is. It's creating something. It's creating something. That, that, uh, that feels really independent. Well, it is independent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's important. People, people want that. The kids want that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hi, I've got a scripting question, really. Yes. 
Um, how do you ensure what checks and balances you put in place? Because you're going to get a like-minded people watching your shows because they're interested in the subject, or toilet seats, whatever the subject is. But how do you check that you're not mocking or belittling the people? So you, I, it's interesting you've got investigating unusual claims. It could be debunking, which is a, a quite a negative term. I'm just wondering what you do with descripting yeah. for that. Well, I'm very careful there, as, as with everything I do with the books, with the articles, with the lectures, with the TV, whatever. I'm always very careful not to belittle, not to uh, make fun of beliefs. Uh, I try to understand a problem, a phenomenon, uh, and I describe it first as it appears from the outside, all the mystery that it's in it. So I start with that, and uh, if you listen to, to this uh, video, you see a mystery, and then you start wondering, what's happening here? What is there an explanation? And then slowly, I start examine every aspect of the, of the story and reach at the end a conclusion that is based on, on facts, on verified facts. So, but I'm not going to say, so those stupid people really believe that, no, I'm never going to say that. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, can I just check, is there anyone who'd like to ask a question who'd rather have a microphone brought to them? Anyone else? No, the lights are moving right. Okay, lovely. Okay, this might be the last question. Hi. Hi. Uh, you said a little while ago that about 80% of your viewers are male and that you'd like to be able to reach a female audience or possibly other genders. Um, I'm just wondering, do you use, do you have advisors? Do you have people that you consult to, um, to know how to reach that audience? You know, what approach to take, how to approach the subjects and so forth. Are you using other people to help you? Thank you. Uh, there is a, a very useful tool uh, in YouTube for creators, which is uh, an, uh, analytics and statistics that breaks down for every video, for everything you do on, uh, on YouTube, uh, that tells you what, what uh, is liked by whom, and you get an idea of the subjects that are maybe more interesting to a specific kind of audience or another. I don't have uh, uh, somebody... Uh, telling me uh, or to consult. Of course, I, I discuss it with uh, with friends and colleagues, but uh, I don't have a specific uh, source for this kind of uh, of information. What I'm working at is uh, is certainly to to broaden the discussion. That's why I'm also very active now on Instagram, which, as I said, is more um, let's say female oriented because uh, because I don't know, but but it is. And, and, I, and I do different things on, on Instagram, but I also put some clips from, the, from the, the series. And I see that they start to cross. Um, so what, what, what I try to do is spread as much as I can the information and, uh, and try to get them all in one, in one place in the end, where the, the discussion can be very in-depth. And also... Another, another thing which, which is not related to your question but just came to my mind is that uh, it may seem a long 10 minutes or 15 minutes video, but in reality it is not because what YouTube is, is promoting at the moment is longer videos, not short videos like it used to be in the past, two minutes, three minutes. So the longer your video, well, the longer, reasonably longer, uh, the more it is promoted uh, and, it, and it goes up in the search rankings. So it's, uh, it's an occasion to go deeper into a subject. You just, you, you're not forced to be on the surface. If maybe you are on TV, on TV, on radio. You, you can just say two quick phrases and that's it. And if you made an impression or you're quickly forgotten. On YouTube, you have a chance to go deep. The important thing is to make it not boring, but entertaining the whole time and to keep the people watching till the end. And, uh, and from the statistics, I see that this is the case. So there's work to be done in, in writing, but it's important to, you know, to invest in that. Like, yeah, because you have control of that stati those statistics, yeah. unlike if you made a TV show or a book. No. You know who's watching, how long, and yes. you can adjust yes. to, to try and reach more people to watch longer. Okay, okay. great. I think this is going to be the last question. Okay, oh, okay good. Uh, it's a question for you, Helen. Oh, that's no good. He's one answer your question. <laughs> well, I, I really want to know if you play Freebird Lane. <laughs> uh, 
I, I will go and learn Freebird in the lunch break. <laughs> uh, do you play an instrument at all, Massimo? Yeah, I do. Well, uh, wait, it was a question for Massimo after <laughs> all. So we after, no, I don't know after free free lunch, we're duetting Freebird. Uh, That's no, what's going to happen. Yeah, I can play free as a bird, yeah. but not free bird. <laughs> you heard it here first, a Quedcon exclusive uh, of um, duetting a uh, uh, stage performance. So um, I'd like to say thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Massimo, that, that was fantastic, My fascinating, pleasure. brilliant question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are you around later to talk? Are you going to sign books? Absolutely. Okay, fantastic. So